Kia ora koutou. Nau mai, haere mai, ki tēnei wānanga. Ko Caitlin Carew ahau. Nō te awakairangi ahau. Ke kia mana maroa ngā ākina o te ao tūrawa ahau e mahi ana. He kaihautu whakapā ahau. Kia ora koutou. I'm Caitlin Carew. I'm the Senior Communications Advisor for the Resilience National Science Challenge. Welcome to today's webinar on the Kopapa, the resilience of Aotearoa New Zealand's built environment. We'll be looking at how research is improving the resilience of our buildings and infrastructure networks to natural hazards. We'll be hearing about work being led by Associate Professor Liam Wotherspoon of the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at the University of Auckland and Professor Tim Sullivan of the Department of Civil and Natural Resources Engineering at the University of Canterbury. These two co-lead our Built Environments program and will be giving us an overview of the team's work so far and their next steps. I'll begin with our Resilience Challenge Karakia Fiti Ora and then I'll touch on some housekeeping and hand over to the research team. Kimi here te pō, rangahaua te ao, ki a eo rangi, ki a eo whenua, kei ngā mata o te ariki, kei mata nuku, kei mata rangi, kei reira koe e tanei te wai ora, ko ngā maungaru, ko ngā awa parawhenua, here uta ki tai, ki a tangaroa e, ko koe, ko au, ko tau wane, fiti ao, fiti, fiti ora, are mai te toki, haumi e, hui e, tāiaki e. Okay, in terms of housekeeping, we are recording the session, so you'll receive an email with a link to the recording on our YouTube channel. So if you have colleagues who couldn't make it today, please do share that link with them. There will be questions at the end, and that will run through the Q&A box, which you should see at the top of your screen. Please pop questions in as you think of them, so we have a few questions ready to get stuck into when the presentations end. I'll now hand over to Liam to start us off. Thanks, Liam. Great. Thanks for that, Caitlin. Just get things going. Awesome. Oh, kia ora tato. Thanks very much for that, that welcome, Caitlin. Uh, you said my uh, Liam Witherspoon here from University of Auckland, and what we're going to do with this presentation is just a bit of a, uh, a bouncing back and forward between Tim and I working through some of the, the work that's going, ongoing in the in the built environment theme of the Resilience to Nature's Challenges National Science Challenge. So the tagline there, how is research improving the resilience of our buildings and infrastructure networks to natural hazards? So we'll just run through uh, uh, the presentation here, so a bit of an overview of some of the challenges, which I don't think we probably need to describe uh, too broadly, plenty of challenges out there. And just really start by giving a bit of an overview of the built environment program. Uh, I'll talk to the horizontal infrastructure and Tim will talk to the vertical infrastructure. We'll give some examples of stuff that's ongoing in the research space uh, and, and coming out, where we're going from here and wrap it up with a little bit around how do you get hold of us? How do you want to learn a bit, a bit more? How can you collaborate? Uh, happy to hear from you. And yeah, as, as Caitlin has mentioned, keen for you to fire through some questions. We're happy to answer anything as we work our way through. So the challenges, uh, and yeah, as I said, I don't think we need to describe that too much. Um, the, the built environment plays a significant role in our resilience to, nat to natural hazard events, uh, supporting all aspects through from uh, pre-event, during and, and post-event. And we've really seen uh, in the last few years uh, that there's been natural hazard events that have had a significant impact firstly on the built environment and then more importantly on how that built environment supports wider society and that underpins everything we we, we, we have here and broadens out into the, the wider work that's going on within the resilience challenge uh, but we're really focusing I guess Tim and I particularly as, as engineers on that built environment aspect but always having an understanding or an appreciation of what what's the what does that mean what's the so what and so we've had a number of quite significant events in New Zealand uh, since 2010. Certainly, I sort of cut my teeth in the earthquake 
space uh, starting in Canterbury. But if we look from that point onwards, we've had earthquakes, multiple storms, even very recently flooding as a result of some of those storms, coastal inundation, which is having more of an effect as we work our way through. So there's plenty of stuff going on uh, nationally that points to us wanting to understand and improve the, the performance of our built environment. And of course, we then broaden out to internationally and we've got even more events that are going on and the significant uh, things that we've seen uh, in recent years. And that helps to inform how we feed through and apply our research again in the New Zealand context. So the Built Environment Program, what's the key aim is to improve our understanding of the performance of, of infrastructure under various natural hazards. And when we talk about infrastructure, we're talking about buildings, vertical infrastructure, well, Tim will go into more detail there, and then infrastructure networks, which is horizontal infrastructure, which I'll talk to. There's a range of different ways that we can focus on that. Uh, firstly, to improve our approaches for design assessment and repair, and a lot of the vertical infrastructure is underpinned by that. Linked to that is then new, new approaches to inform decision making investment. So how can we better uh, feed through that this, this information of what we think the performance is going to be to inform those next steps? And across the work that we're going to discuss about today, we're really working alongside a range of different stakeholder partners. And so really that real world context to the research is, is very, very important to us. So if we were to di diagrammatically represent the, the built environment program, we can sort of split it into our horizontal infrastructure, so infrastructure networks here, our vertical infrastructure here, and then where these come together or we look at multiple networks or a region or suites of buildings, we start to look more broadly at wider built environment performance. And so we'll touch a little bit more on each of these as we describe what we're doing within the program. So I'll pass it to Tim. Uh, so we have quite a large uh, project team involved in this uh, RNC built environment theme. Over 20 academics um, across the country, I guess, uh, over 30 postgraduate students. And um, and that's really the research that our postgraduate students is really contributing a lot to what we're able to achieve. You know, they're a really important part and we see them, bene they benefit us and we're helping them as they're developing. We also have the strong collaborations with stakeholders and industry groups with some of our projects are more regionally focused and so we then work on collaborating with the regional groups some of them are network specific some of the infrastructure that liam will talk about is quite specific to infrastructure so then there's good discussion and collaboration with those groups and some of it is discipline focused for example we do work in steel structures and so we work with the the steel association and so on so um, next slide. Within vertical infrastructure, as Liam was saying, we have both a vertical infrastructure and a horizontal infrastructure group, and I help lead the vertical infrastructure. <clears throat> and in that, we're trying to cover or we'll look at um, the resilience of, of a range of building types. So we talk about commercial buildings and we look at low rise residential as well as medium density residential. We, in doing so, we are considering a range of uh, construction materials. So whether we're constructural steel or re reinforced concrete or timber, we're doing research in all those. You could also say we're looking at soil as a material because we, we look at the foundations. Um, and then we are looking at both component behavior as well as system behavior and, and the way of relating that component behavior to system behavior. So. The first point there around that we're, we're gaining better information on the structural and non-structural components, and then we connect that to the whole of building performance. And I'll talk a little bit more later about what do we mean by building performance. And then we also are trying to link the design criteria we use. So whether that's in a code or some of these emerging design criteria, we're trying to link that to again building performance. And we think about that from a building specific performance or from a regional performance of buildings. How, do a, how does the Wellington region perform if we have a magnitude 8 earthquake somewhere, for example? Uh, next slide. In the vertical infrastructure space, we identified at the start of the project a number of these sort of specific aims. Uh, we want to understand better the natural hazard induced demands on vertical infrastructure and 
advance our understanding of what we call what we refer to as structural fragility and vulnerability. And a little bit I'll highlight what we mean by that in terms of engineering sense uh, later. Uh, we also are looking at uh, advancing our methods for natural hazard design and assessment. So those are the, the procedures engineers use. And um, how do we then, once we've, we've done a design, how do we quantify the performance in terms that will be important for stakeholders? And, and finally, what are what are our future resilience trajectories? What can we do in terms of research that's going to help make things easier in the future to to, to reduce our, our, our improve our resilience? Next slide. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, so and then the, the horizontal infrastructure space in a similar sense, we're sort of moving to those uh, increasing level of complexities. So as I said, horizontal infrastructure or infrastructure networks, we look across a range of different network types. So tra different transport networks, different types of energy, communications, three waters and flood defence. You might actually wrap those two and call them four waters if you like. If you like. And then from there, we're really moving through from individual pieces of those networks or components of those networks to understand in a similar sense to what Tim has mentioned in the building space, how do they perform? What's their level of damage and functionality as they're being exposed to hazards of different intensities? So we sort of start at this point. We then move into uh, assessment of networks and so networks by, by the nature of them being networks are connected uh, systems. And so to really rep represent the connectivity and flow within those networks, bring network specific experts in to, run it, to really try to explore and assess different resilience aspects and decision making. And then the next step beyond that is that within those different infrastructure networks, they rely on each other or they're dependent on each other. So if it's dependencies or interdependencies across both, how do we bring that in to try to understand how one network might influence another? And that really can inform decision makings in the future because that they're as important as their networks uh, themselves. So across the aims, they're quite similar aims in the horizontal infrastructure space, but with a focus on those networks themselves. So the natural hazard induced demands on those different horizontal infrastructure networks. How do we uh, improve our understanding of the performance of different components using case history data and modeling uh, to, to better constrain that, particularly in the New Zealand conditions? How do we bring in these network specific aspects and really start to look at these systems, uh, infrastructures as systems and tie all those together? Uh, and then again, similar to what uh, Tim has mentioned we examine these future resilience trajectories. How are these, how are these uh, networks going to change in the future? What does that mean in terms of how we decide our, our interventions that we apply and the decisions that we make around that? And so if we can tie, tie those all together and just to sort of an example using, using Wellington region as a, as, a, as a focus, we've got a range of different infrastructure networks that are all there uh, in place and interact. And then we've got the buildings that rely on those infrastructure net networks to function as well. So as we start to improve our understanding of all these different pieces, we can build that up and then start to tie them across and really get a really good understanding of different regions or different portfolios. What are the key decisions we can make to improve the resilience of that wider built environment? OK, so what we're going to do now is we're going to run through a few examples of, of research that's underway in the vertical and horizontal space. And so it's a bit of a quick fire smorgasbord of work that's ongoing, and hopefully this will spark some questions as we work our way through. So I'll pass it over to Tim to kick us off. Okay, thanks, Liam. Uh, so yes, as Liam was mentioning, we won't be able to run through all the projects we've been involved with, but just giving a selection and 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 as Liam says, we'd be keen to hear from people who are interested in, in learning more or, or wanting to collaborate. So the first project I thought I'd mention is actually as a follow on from some research we'd done through Quake Core into base isolated housing. We we tested this house you can see on the shape table there. Well, house, it's a, it's a room of a house and um, and we uh, we decided, well, we've done all the shape table testing. We don't have damage. How about we now fix this? Because this was a, a building done by a New Zealand builder to the to the standard. And let's test this this house and improve our ability to assess the vulnerability of our housing. And so we would do this shape table testing. You would, we would observe at what intensity of shaking we start to get damage. And if you just keep clicking there a bit, Liam. 
we're then able to use the information we get from that test to, to validate some of our numerical models and we're able to compare the predictions of a, of a house, let's say, um, modelled and analysed with our computer software with that which we observe on the shake table and we are able to get good correlation and this is actually, we understand, the first shake table test of a New Zealand uh, type of uh, construction of a house on, on the shake table. Uh, next slide. That, that previous work is, is useful because it can help us predict the vulnerability and, and think about how we can reduce that vulnerability in future earthquakes of the of the top part of a house. Another aspect that we are looking at in this part of the project is around the foundation performance. And of course, after the Canterbury earthquakes, there was a lot of liquefaction, which caused a lot of damage. And there have been solutions proposed to that. And in, in Canterbury region, for example, they use a lot of different what we call TC2, TC3 foundation solutions. In this project, we were just investigating how we think those are going to perform. If we think about a certain loss of, of bearing support by, because of liquefaction, then we investigate how does the house get, get through it? Do, do we expect to see cracking? And how does it depend on the number of stories or the, the, the weight of, this, of the house and so on? Next slide. Another type of uh, research we're doing related again to the ground is, is um, Ma Maxim Millen and others have, have been looking at tools for uh, ass assessing the soil structure interaction. So when we look at assessing performance of buildings, we need to understand how the building itself is behaving, that sort of the timber frame house models I talked about, but that was on a rigid table. What if we've got a soil profile and they're able to compare their numerical methods with experimental results and you can see the comparison of the grey and blue lines on the top right there. They're showing they're getting pretty good comparison. Um, next slide. We also are doing research to quantify the likely performance of modern commercial buildings uh, and this is an example of what we call a BRB building. This is a building with they call them buckling restrained braces. These are braces that are designed not to buckle. And um, and that's good from an element point of view, but it does depend on how well you do your connection detailing. And there's been experimental tests conducted previously that we were able to then benefit from in our modeling and analysis and really highlight, well, if you change the connection detail, you can actually change significantly the fragility of the building. And some of that is also related to, did you know you had a problem? You'd need a 3D model to highlight whether you had a problem or not. And so we were able to sort of go through the process of not only quantifying how the connections can perform, but also what does that really mean in terms of the annual rate of collapse for a building? And how does that correlate with expectations? Next slide. So a big part of our or an important part of our research is around performance. And in order to quantify performance and in, in one measure of performance is to think about repair cost or loss. And so the process we go through there is, is a four stage process. We, we first of all need hazard information, which is telling us how likely it is to have different levels of shaking intensity. Then we go on to, once we have a certain level of shaking intensity we're interested in, we build our structural analysis models and we work out how much are the buildings likely to displace. Once we've worked out how much they're likely to displace and what the floor accelerations are, we then are able to quantify how much damage they're likely to, to get. We use fragility functions to do that, to, work, to correlate displacement or acceleration with damage. And once we know the damage, which means what, what are the repair costs, what are the repair actions you need, we then put costs to those. So if you know you need to uh, jib, stop and, um, and paint your walls, uh, then there'd be a certain cost associated with that. And we sum that up over all these different earthquakes to work out the total losses. Yep, next slide, Liam. So an example of us doing that is looking at these reinforced concrete wall buildings. You can um, get, click a bit. Um, just keep going there, Liam. Yeah, so these are located in Wellington and Christchurch. There are four and 12 storey commercial office buildings. These are what we call case study in the sense they're not, they're representative of real buildings, but they're not an actual building. Uh, they're designed according to the code, but in this research, what we're also exploring is if we design them to different procedures. So 
just a standard code design versus what we call a low damage design, which is where we're trying to achieve better performance from our buildings and we use different design criteria to do that. So we, we, we do the design and we'll go to the next slide. And then we go through that loss assessment process, I said, and as part of that, we're doing structural analyses of those buildings and we're able to compare how the, the buildings that were done using what you see the, the different um, conventional versus LDSD, which is referring to the low damage design, the, the dash lines are the low damage and the conventional are the solid lines in different regions, Wellington versus Christchurch. And you can see as a function of the return period of earthquake shaking, um, how much the buildings are likely to drift, what are the peak floor accelerations you might expect. And then we take that information and we use that in our loss assessment process. If you go to the next slide then. And we're able to see how um, we're able to look at those losses in terms of both those elements which are sensitive to displacements and drifts, how much cost are we in incurring there? And you can see comparing the left with the middle columns that the blue lines, the blue, the blue areas have really dropped. So that the low damage design criteria which we're focusing on drift have been really successful in reducing the loss. So that EAL stands for expected annual loss, which is like saying the repair cost you expect per year on average. Of course, we don't get earthquakes that cause damage every year, but if over the lifetime of a building, that's sort of what you expect. Uh, next slide, Liam. Or maybe just then click. Yeah. OK, so we do that process for a range of buildings in uh, across the country with different types of structural systems. And then we thought, well, it'd be interesting to compare how New Zealand buildings rate with international buildings that have assessed the losses in similar ways. And you can see uh, if you click there, Liam, our buildings are falling in fairly low, low loss range. This does depend on a number of assumptions you make in your loss assessment process as well, of course, on the seismicity of your region. But but the, the indications are, are generally pretty good. Next slide. But in, in order to gain confidence in our loss assessment process, we really do need good information on the fragility. And this is an example of research we've done into the fragility of components. This was early on in the, this, this project. We, we took some glazing systems and you can see the glazing system with all those cameras. It's almost like a paparazzi thing. You've got the glazing there with it's it's attached between two concrete slabs as you would get it built in a building and then we displace the top slab relative to the bottom and after we displace it a certain amount we return it back to zero we then have the blue box behind it which is spraying it with water simulating a big rainstorm go to the next slide what we're able to see then is when does the glazing start to leak and we find that does depend on the, the glazing system. Um, where there's not a lot of information like this out in the industry. And this provides us, provided us with quite a bit of useful information. We go to the next slide. We also keep pushing the, the, the glazing and, and you start to observe damage states such as gasket fallout and frame damage. And eventually you can even develop glass fallout, but that doesn't really happen until you start displacing the building a very large amount. And what's interesting is that the leakage can occur without any visible signs of damage. You go to the next slide. And, and what we're able to then do is take the experimental data and pull out from that information. If you just click one time there, Liam, um, it'll tell you, I oh know, maybe the next slide after that. Let's go to the next slide. No, OK, it doesn't matter. Basically, if on that slide, I was just trying to uh, highlight that. For, for leakage, it only takes about 10 millimetres displacement of that glazing to cause uh, the loss of water tightness. And so that's suggesting this that's really useful information for our for our loss assessment. And then could also provide useful information for our choices around how do we reduce that vulnerability? What glazing systems will perform better? Uh, next system, this slide. We also need recognised as part of this project the need for better communication rather than performance. There are a number of traditional ways that engineers have talked about building performance. Um, one important one is life safety. Um, and the, when you're designing a building, you would talk with your engineer and, and, and agree on, on design objectives. Is it a basic objective on some? However, 
from a client perspective, uh, the client, the, the client or the building owner might be asking, well, what, what about repair costs? What about repair time? What about injuries or fatalities? Or even uh, what does, how, how long am I going to be out of my building? You can just keep clicking there, Liam. And so what we're trying to do in, in this research is, is start to help improve the tools and, and our ability to, to actually quantify some of those things. So we go to the next slide. And there are options for, for doing that. And of course, that's why we're looking at low damage buildings, because it's not just about whether we can quantify it, but a actually how can we then provide building owners with a choice about can they, do they just want standard code or do they want something better? Does that better meet their performance objectives? And we could look at, at losses, as I was saying before, like repair costs. There's work going on to try and quantify repair time. If you go to the next slide, Liam, even uh, from a part of our project, we have a, a master student, um, Kakati Royal, who's working with us, um, looking at also from a performance of, of different stakeholders. Take, for example, he, Kakati is, is Māori and he's working with Māori community to try and understand what are the, the performance measures, what's important for performance in specific, say, to housing um for, for for maori and and how would we uh, then set our design criteria to achieve important performance measures for maori that can be can be different from the standard code uh performance objectives great thanks for that tim we'll now shift uh into some examples of the work going on in the in the horizontal infrastructure and the network space so one of the, the key things that's transferred over uh, was to try to, as I said, bring in modeling of networks in a, at, a, at a network expert level. So using transportation engineers in this example to try to understand, well, if we build a transport model for the South Island and that we can see a business as usual transport model of the South Island, these are the different roads and the different traffic counts that we see uh, on those different roads. Can we use that model and then modify it to try and understand what happens for different natural hazard events? So in this in this project, the uh, the approach taken was to look at an alpine fault event. It was first actually what well, this project was used uh, to validate using the Kaikoura earthquake, and then looking at uh, what might happen in terms of the roads and how roads came back online following an alpine fault event not only sort of in a damage sense or in a connectivity sense, but what was the change in the flows on different uh, stretches of road after that sort of event. And so we can see here day one, as you'd expect, most of the roads are lost. And then so many of these transports, either trips are lost or they're shifted onto different roads. And then six months based on this sort of scenario of a, of a recovery trajectory, what does that mean in terms of the transport uh, system and so this is a useful model that's now being used to look at a range of other disrupted events perhaps not as severe as an alpine fault event it's a good test to apply but when we lose a bridge when we've seen examples of flood events we can utilize this model to actually bring some quantitative measures in terms of how transport networks change and adapt based on the ability to to, to model that using this transport network specific software uh, and so that a really good example of by bringing in uh, network specific experts, you can really delve into networks in a lot more detail and explore not just sort of hard measures, but also ma management measures in terms of uh, how a system might respond. Looking uh, in the coastal space, uh, and this is with partnership with the coastal program within RNC, there's work trying to understand in an engineering context some of the protection structures that we have in place. And when we think about sea level rise and, and storm surge events and how those are going to uh, influence each other, there's questions that we can ask or things that are occurring with those systems. So if we think about overtopping when waves to, uh, come over a structure or the stability of a structure itself, whether they actually degraded over time due to the, the loads that are applied, can look at what's happening now and what we can do about it. And so this project sort of has those four quadrants of looking at examples of overtopping events, what's happening and how might this change? What does this mean in terms of the function of what's going on behind those structures? 
we see examples here of structural stability where we get sea level rise in different storm surge wave systems. How does this uh, erode and damage what we've got there? And so if we, we, we have these, these uh, structures in place now, so the question is, well, what can we do about it? And so there's ways both in a lab and in a field context that can be explored about is there modifications or, or uh, things that we can do uh, in this first step sort of engineering context to try to mitigate. So for example, how do we remove the, the overtopping or mitigate the overtopping? Uh, for example, here, this is Tamaki Drive in, in Auckland. Is there things we can do to try to reduce those events? Uh, and also in terms of stability, is the retrofit or is there different approaches that can be applied, staged approaches, for example, to construct these different uh, as one of the options that we may use when we're looking at some of these events and, and the impact that these events have on the functionality of our infrastructure networks and the, the communities that they support. Uh, focusing in on uh, work looking at marae and pa uh, in particular, and if you've listened to any of the RNC presentations in the past, you might have heard uh, this uh, work uh, coming out of Akuhata's uh, PhD, again, a, a, pro, uh, a project that's uh, co-funded with the Coastal Programme. And so some of uh, Akuhata's uh, master's work was looking at coastal marae and understanding uh, the exposure of coastal marae to current and future sea level rise and storm surge events. And so this has really developed into the next step where Akuhata is looking at a co-development of a decolonized managed retreat strategy. And so the first steps there has really been exploring, well, What's examples of where uh, Marae and Māori have been adapted to the natural hazard events? And so Akuhata has pulled together a database based on a range of different approaches of understanding where there's been examples of this uh, movement uh, taking place and some of the hazards that have actually been the, the reason for those. Uh, and um, you know, really, really highlighting that Māori have been adapting to natural hazards for centuries for a range of different reasons and a range of different approaches and collected examples for as far back as the, the 15th century to today. So that's forming the basis for the next steps to understand, OK, well, if we've seen examples, what does this mean looking to the future and how this might be approached? Moving to tsunami. So there's a one of the key question marks we have. Uh, New Zealand internationally is, is the inundation as a result of tsunami. And so some work uh, we've been looking at is trying to, well, what started off as a, a simple approach became slightly less simple, but is now a really interesting method that's been developed to be able to rapidly model tsunami inundation. And so based on information on the wave of, of wave heights at the coast and the land cover and topography uh, looking inland, uh, able to very rapidly model uh, and estimate tsunami inundation uh, at different parts. And the idea is to do this all across New Zealand. And so in our context in the built environment, that's been used to understand what might be exposed. And we can see an example here for Christchurch, where we have different coloured infrastructure. So we've got road, railway and buildings. And we can see as we go from a one metre tsunami to a two, three, four, five, six, we can see as the tsunami height at the coast increases, what does that mean in terms of the cumulative exposure uh, of our built environment? And then this is being used and linked to improved models in a New Zealand context of the performance of those. So similar to what Tim had mentioned about fragility curves or vulnerability curves, we can link that with those to really get an understanding of what does that mean in terms of damage and the consequent impact on the broader uh, infrastructure network. So ways that we've been able to do that is case history data. There's not a huge amount of case of history data in New Zealand context, as there's been some good work pulling together international examples uh, of case history data to inform the development of models to represent component performance. But in, uh, another key aspect or approach is physical modelling. And so there's a tsunami flume at the University of Auckland, and that's been used. It creates effectively a dam break similar to a similar characteristics to a tsunami bore, and that can be used to assess the performance of different infrastructure components. And we can see here an example where we've got a uh, a breakwater. We've got the tsunami coming in in and over the breakwater. And this ex example was looking at the erosion of those breakwater components when that tsunami uh, bore of different heights came through. 
similar things being done linked to Tim's program in the vertical infrastructure now to use the tsunami bore and understand the loading on buildings. Buildings of various type, various cap characteristics. How does different openings affect those loading characteristics? Uh, what does that mean in terms of how we could explore different requirements for design and then of course performance of the broader environment and this has a really important part to play when we're thinking about things like tsunami evacuation structures and how do our existing or new buildings perform if we might need to put those in place and here's just an example of a video here gosh so we can see uh, this example of that step ball coming down and this is looking at a small scale model of culverts as we see in past events that culverts can uh, get damaged quite easily in a uh, tsunami event. They become a weak point on the transport network. So trying to better understand their performance and characteristics. Moving from the components there to broader systems as there's work that's been done to try to understand systems here. And when we're talking about systems here, we're talking about the port system across the country. So they're a key component uh, of the wider transport system. But when we think about something like a tsunami and we know we've got different potential uh, regional, local or, or distal source tsunami um, sources, they can affect multiple ports. So what does that mean if we've got these events that might affect multiple ports? So we can see our main key points, uh, ports around, around the country. And so this work was trying to look at uh, what was the sort of potential system level effects of a tsunami. So if we looked at example here, this is a, a Peru source scenario. So we 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 model a, a tsunami starting over in uh, Peru there, and then when that wave propagates over to New Zealand, we can look at the maximum water level and the maximum current within the ports as we get different magnitude uh, subduction zone events over in Peru. And the key thing there is both the water level and the current speed can result in damage. And so if we looked at this Peru scenario here from sort of significant to moderate, the circles are where we might have significant to moderate damage as a result of water level, and the triangle is where we might have damage as well as functionality impacts as a result uh, of current speeds within those ports. And so you can clearly see here in this, this example that there'll be much broader impact on the port system and what does that mean about how that might respond uh, as, as, a, as a key aspect of the, the broader transport system, logistics, movement of goods and people, etc. Moving to flooding, as I said before, we want to try to collect data where we can and more difficult in the past, but easier from this from the from now into the future. And so, for example, on the 2021 Canterbury flood, we worked to pull together all the information we could on the impacts in terms of damage, but also in terms of functionality of the different infrastructure networks. And we can see here an example where this was quite a, a widespread event that caused all sorts of disruptions across uh, the Canterbury region. And so this is being used and pulled together. And so we have spatial as well as temporal understanding of road closures and other infrastructure impacts. And that's really useful for us to understand, okay, what might this mean moving forward? And we can apply this knowledge to future events. And then the last thing I want to talk about is flood, flood and related to systems. And so when we've got dams and stock banks uh, in our different catchments, our stock banks is a flood defense network and a dam form a part of that network too, but they're managed often by different organizations. So if we start to look at that system together, what does that mean in terms of ways that we could approach dealing and managing with any sort of uh, potential flood event to try to mitigate or minimize some of those impacts? And so if we look at different catchments, we can see here we've got uh, different catchments here and we can see we've got locations where we have uh, dams that are located and there might be just detention net dams or dams that are used for storage or generation we might have a range of different detention dams within the broader flood defense network. So these systems will all perform quite differently and there's also different decisions that we can make when we look at these systems. So this is work trying to understand uh, that broader decision making when we're looking at a catchment by catchment uh, scale and also the different structure of that relationship between the stock banks and the dams. So that was just a 
quick fire overview from Tim and my side. The next steps, I guess, there's a lot of there's a lot of next steps, and we can't cover all those either in the in the scope of this presentation. But really, in the horizontal space, we we are looking at electricity transmission and distribution. We're looking at telecommunications, urban stormwater, and a lot of works looking at the dependencies across these multiple networks, as well as continuing to focus on some of those networks that I've presented so far. If you think about focus areas, there's both single and multiple hazards that's being explored. Uh, how do we improve the or better understand criticality of importance of those networks? Uh, when, when we're looking at a network, robustness as well as redundancies are really key aspects, aspects when we're exploring when we need to inform decisions makings. As Tim had mentioned, but more, and I've mentioned, there's adaptations for communities uh, as well as different hapu and iwi. Uh, and Another key aspect is how to integrate across asset management and resilience, which is a good, I guess, driver or motivator of that thinking when we're thinking about infrastructure networks. In terms of uh, the vertical space, we're we're trying to we're going to be continuing to develop our means of uh, linking seismic design criteria to modern building performance measures. We're thinking about losses and damage and disruption. And of course, um, as part of that, we, we recognise as well that we're getting more information. For example, there's a new seismic hazard model uh, come out, so there'll be a challenge for the community to try and update our standards and and our um, our design provisions. So we want to be helping them in doing that. Um, and so that's the second point there: assessing the performance of alternative design provisions on the provisions on the performance of buildings also considering these more severe loading scenarios. And then the third so general next step um, is identifying more cost effective means of reducing the vulnerability of our buildings. If you're interested to, to engage with us, we'd be glad to hear from you. There's a range of opportunities to get involved. We have um, research collaboration with other researchers, we're happy to work with. Uh, there's stakeholder partnership opportunities where you know it's really valuable. For example, I know in the, the horizontal infrastructure networks, they they couldn't do a lot of the research without the great collaboration they have with their partners there. And then regional case study applications, uh, uh, of course, there's opportunities there. We have uh, regular meetings, and and those are open to anyone who would like to come along and listen and and ask questions. And, and there's also re infrastructure research days planned. And then finally, there's part of a, a collaborations in, the, in this wider research ecosystem. We have on the right, we've got all these different research groups indicated, Quake Core, East Coast Lab, AF8 and so on. So, so that we also are reaching out and working and, and a number of these projects do cut across multiple uh, objectives there. So if that's it, I'd just like to say thank you and um, and uh, thank you. Thanks for the attention and and we look forward to to hearing your questions as well. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Liam and Tim. Um, that was really great to hear about the really broad range of research um, that you and your team are involved in. Um, we have a couple of questions um, please do pop your questions in the chat so i'm um, sorry in the q a box so we can um, answer your questions um, so first question from derek um, this is for liam i'm assuming you need access to nationwide network data for the horizontal research do you have access to all the data you need you probably never ask a researcher if they've got access to all the data they need because we'll always be greedy. <laughs> but I think the key point to make is linked is linking to the collaborations that we have in place. So um, with a lot of these projects, by virtue of the nature of the, the research that's going on, we are sitting alongside a range of stakeholder organisations um, who are everything from providing data through to driving the research uh, at the very top. So, so we do have access uh, to vast arrays of different data sets of different forms. Um, as we 
as we sort of take the work that we're doing, where as I said, a lot of it's pro is either regionally focused or we have, if we have national agencies, we would usually have a national focus, but if we're regionally focused and we can see that that might be expanding, moving out to other regions, then we would start to engage once we've sort of had that proof of concept that some of these approaches are working. So yeah, we've, we, we definitely have really good uh, relationships and engagements, but um, yeah, there is always additional data and, I think underpinning all this, and I've actually mentioned this in a, an event earlier the week, is one of the key things we are thinking about is how can we do that more efficiently and effectively? And it goes both ways in terms of that data sharing, um, making that available so that the research can focus on the research and maybe less about cleaning data sets before we get going. Um, so there's a few different things in play there, but yeah, we, 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 we are grateful to, to the relationships we have with the different organisations that are sharing that. Cool, thank you. Um, another question from Derek. Liam, are you liaising with the Lifelines Council, Lisa Roberts, etc., and CDM groups about this work? I do wonder if there are complementary projects uh, with the Lifelines Resilience work they do. Yes. <laughs> uh, so one of so uh, within the within the um, horizontal infrastructure group, uh, Roger Fairclough from the New Zealand Lifelines Council sits within that as one of his many hats uh, with, with, with that work. And yeah, we I have you know good relationships with a number of uh, the different CDM groups through different organisations, for example, South Island through AF8. We've made sure to make that all integrated. Uh, and yeah, Lisa and I certainly discuss and I, one of those the key points of that is yeah we try to feed through stuff to Lisa as part of the work developing and updating those different national vulnerability studies. So yes, we can always do better, but we've put a lot of effort into creating those strong relationships and understanding who are the key people that can then spread that out to everyone else. Thank you. Um, one from Craig, what's the state of knowledge about volcanic lahar and horizontal infrastructure damage, particularly bridges and pipeline crossings, etc. You're pro probably asking the wrong person uh, mm -hmm. there. Um, certainly, I think that as far as I'm aware, that's one of the key hazards in terms of the volcanic focus programs that are going on. That is one of those next steps that they're trying to delve into. Um, I will say, you know, if we looked at something like flooding, which happens more often, there's probably a, a lot still to left to be desired in terms of how we can represent the impact of flooding um, on on bridges and other infrastructure, and that's something that we see every single year. So, Lahar is, you know, the next step beyond that. Um, and you know, I think if if we're able to advance the work in the flooding space then that would go a long way to help informing performance of things like laha where you've got similar but different processes occurring i, I will say that um as tim had mentioned sort of fragility or vulnerability models for different types of buildings and the same thing for infrastructure that's one of our biggest knowledge gaps and certainly one of our biggest knowledge gaps when we uh, apply that in a New Zealand context. So some of the stuff that Tim's been talking about with in the buildings, you know, those are the first models or fragility models that have been developed to represent New Zealand design and performance, etc. And the same thing applies in the infrastructure space. That's that's our biggest our biggest unknown, and it's because we need to either build on case history data, or we need to do modelling. And both of those have those their positives and benefits, or 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 do it or apply that or link that with expert elicitation. So there's a lot of activity in that space to try to improve our understanding because I think sometimes there's the perception that we've got that nailed down. <laughs> I would say we certainly don't. There's a huge, huge knowledge gap in that space. Thanks, Liam. Um, the next question um, I'll put to you both. It's from Mark. Is there any work on developing a set of measures of how durable New Zealand's physical infrastructure is in terms of being able to withstand natural and man-made hazards? So perhaps Tim will go to you first and then Liam. Um, so I, I guess that's coming back to that fragility um, work in the sense that 
all the work we do around fragility of building components where we're trying to understand what's the deformation that causes them to get the different levels of damage and what's the acceleration level or so on that that is all useful information it's about characterizing the capacity but it's not just about characterizing and saying there's a single value of capacity it's about understanding there are uncertainties in that and then with that information on the uncertainty and capacity the likely capacity as well as the uncertainty we can build that into then looking at these hazards which we know there's we can we can get uh, sort of armageddon type of events but they're very very unlikely so we then couple the the likelihood of a certain type of hazard event occurring uh, let's say an earthquake of a certain intensity with the likelihood of damage with that intensity and then that can inform our decisions around our ability to to deal with 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 those hazards anything further from you liam it was just a thumbs up thumbs up from me <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. as i said i think there's, there's there's there is work active but there is still a lot uh, that we can do in that space mm. okay one from jessica Local government organisations are having conversations about managed retreat. How could this research assist these organisations? Who wants to have a go at that? Um, I, yeah, I'm not going to delve. So managed retreat is not uh, a topic that I uh, have delved into in significant detail. Um, so I don't want to go too far in terms of the weeds of this. I think some of the stuff that's ongoing there is work that's ongoing right now and i some of the aspects for that uh i guess in an infrastructure space is bringing into the conversation about managed retreat not just um direct exposure of of homes etc but how does uh, climate change affects impact on indirect impacts and so there's work trying to understand not just is your property directly exposed, but also will you will you lose access to key services that you need as part of your everyday life? And so it's and this is this broader aspect around dependencies or interdependencies is the indirect is often just as important as the direct when we're thinking about how we want to live our lives. Uh, habitability, a lot of work going on in that space too. So that's probably some of the key things that's being fed into that. And this is, re I guess, in the in the built it's built space, we're probably mostly focusing on developing that evidence, the, the evidence base or the quantitative data that then informs the next steps in those decision in that decision making. Um, and you know, uh, Tim and I, Tim and I as, as engineers, uh, we perhaps if we would traditionally feel about, you know, how do we engineer ourselves out of this stuff? But certainly I think with the the multidisciplinary nature that underpins all the work that we do, you know, we, we can't think in that way and we don't think in that way. There's a big broad suite of decisions that can be made and a lot of different uh, actions that can be taken from the engineering all the way through um, to, to manage retreat and, and everything in between. Yeah, I guess in terms of just adding to that, um, as Liam says, it, it is quite a multidisciplinary type of problem, and that's where our linkages to other groups, you know, there are projects within Quake Core and within some of these others where we're looking at, at how, so there's an emphasis to say, look, we need better planning, um, and, and planning is a big challenge. Um, so I, I think the topic is, is certainly, certainly starting to enter a number of researchers' minds. Um, what the answers are, we we don't really know yet. So, thank you. Um, one from Gavin: Are any of your projects currently being used to inform long-term investment plans slash business cases in critical infrastructure, e.g., replacement, strengthening, etc.? Yes. Yeah, so we've had. Uh, examples of different projects where it's both uh, everything from from sort of management based decisions, uh, interesting stuff looking at things like like in the power network approaches to island uh, distribution networks to keep things running when they're lo losing ex uh, 
access to the uh, transmission system. Um, as I mentioned, there's these quite active projects right now looking at the integration of, of, of resilience into asset management. I think that's sort of where we see quite an interesting driver to try to feed those decisions, you know, it's, and, it's, and it's how that sits within that normal, normal asset management um, approach. And then you're working with different um, uh, lifelines groups is one of the, the the key focuses where we feed that through. This this a lot of this work is um, I guess early in the piece, and there's a lot actually le left still to to evolve. But we have used these new methods to provide sort of evidence base that adds a different sort of perspective on what the implications of these events might be. And then that feeds into those decisions as you've described about, well, what can we what can we do next about it? Yeah, and I just from a from a building's point of view, the tools we're developing for loss assessment, that they are used and they can be used uh, to try help inform those decisions. Like, you, you might be able to assess, have the engineer help assess what's the cost to retrofit, and then you can look at, well, what does that do to your expected annual losses over the lifetime of a building? Is it worthwhile or not? The challenge there is, as I was saying, we need, as we do more research, we get more confidence in the in the numbers that are coming out from our loss assessments. And and it's always difficult when you make those proje projections because you know we're, we're in quite a changing environment in terms of inflation and how would that affect things. So, so the the research we're doing is contributing to the tools that are needed for that. Um, we aren't specifically going and doing those studies for stakeholders, um, but the research we're doing could help the community do that sort of work. Cool, thank you. Um, we've got time for just one more question, I think. Um, it's not a straightforward one, but maybe just your quick thoughts, Liam, and then we'll wrap up. Um, from Robert, the modelling on transport for an AF8, um, I presume that means a Alpine Fault Magnitude 8 event, shows South Westland could be isolated for quite some time. Has there been modelling of the transport network, road, sea and air, for central Wellington after a major earthquake on the Wellington Fault? Um, so there was some work, and again, I can't talk to this in any detail because I wasn't involved in it. So external to this work, there was the Wellington Resilience Study or Wellington Resilience Program Business Case Study that looked at a Wellington Vault event across all different infrastructure providers. Uh, I don't think they were doing a transport modelling based approach but that was looking certainly at when you have the impacts of that event and the, the the region splitting into islands, trying to understand periods of time where there was transport between those islands and at what point that opened up and what that meant. And that, that's that being fed into the next step in terms of economic modelling using merit uh, to understand those, those broad implications. So yeah, uh, a separate study was done a few years ago. Um, looking at that, again, I don't think to the resolution, but perhaps for some of the those sort of events, that level of resolution may not even be required. It's more where those key connections between those suburbs or the islands, as they call them, and what that means in terms of uh, recovery uh, trajectories for the region. Thank you, Liam. Um, there's just one question from Justin we didn't get to, but I'll share all the questions with the um, with the researchers, and we can perhaps send out information by email, including linking to other RNC projects that were referenced in some of those responses. Um, so thank you um, once again to Liam and Tim for your presentations um, and your responses to those really um, thought-provoking questions. Um, and thank you to our audience for joining us today. I hope it was useful for you. And Liam and Tim are happy to continue these conversations um, if further questions occur to you. Um, we'll be sharing their slides with you all and their contact details are in their slides. So I'll close now with a karakia to send us on our way. Kia whakaaria te tapu, kia wātia ai te ara, kia tūduki whakataha ai, kia tūduki whakataha ai, haumi e, hui e, tāiaki e. Ka kite anō. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Cheers.